Well, hello, my name is Mo, and I'm a toxicologist and risk assessor. Today, I will cover the safety of cypress oil. Yes, the oil that went viral as a hair removal miracle. Is it safe? And should you use it? Let's find out. Before we start, let's quickly cover its efficacy. I already addressed this in a previous video, debunking the evidence behind this oil. So, is it effective? The answer is most likely no. But it can be a good option if you want to use it to remove someone's credit from a video or a script if you understand what I mean. Since this oil has a very limited data regarding safety, I decided to conduct my own safety assessment. It will give us a very preliminary view on the potential hazard and exposure risks. Let's start by talking how chemical risk assessment are usually done. When scientists evaluate the safety of a substance, like a skincare ingredient or essential oil in this case, they follow a structured approach that consists of four main steps. Step number one is called hazard assessment. This is all about identifying potential dangers. Scientists ask the following question. Could this substance cause harm? And if so, what kind of harm? They look at whether the chemical could cause health issues like skin irritation, organ damage, or even hormonal disruption. The second step is dose-response relationship. This step is where the scientists figure out how much of the substance is harmful. They study how different amount of the chemical affect the body to determine at what level it become dangerous. Think of it as finding the line between a safe amount and a potentially harmful amount. Step number three is exposure assessment. Here, the goal is to understand how much of the substance people are likely to be exposed to. Scientists considered where and how often the substance is used, like whether it's applied on the skin, inhaled, or even ingested. Step number four is risk management. Based on the information from the first three steps, this last step involved making recommendation to minimize any identified risk. This might mean setting safety limit or guidelines, adding warning labels, or even banning the substance if it's deemed too risky. So that is the full risk assessment process, identifying hazard, understanding safe levels, estimating exposure, and then managing the risk. Now, because I'm doing this risk assessment on Cypress Oil with limited data and resources, I've used a simpler approach. I'm focusing on just two of those four steps, hazard assessment and exposure assessment. This type of computational or what we call it in silico approach, meaning using computer models to do a simulation and an estimation, is helpful as an early screening tool, but it's not a complete risk assessment. To be more accurate, what I did is a first tier assessment. It's an initial streamlined risk assessment designed to quickly identify potential hazard and exposure risk without going into deep experimental or complex testing. It serves as a preliminary screening to flag substance that may require further or more detailed investigations. So here is what I did. I started with basic question, what is Cypress oil? The composition of Cypress oil can vary widely depending on where it is sourced. I reviewed literature from studies in South Africa, Nigeria, and Asia where the oils show different profile based on the region. I also came across a great paper that did a fantastic job covering different variation of the oils and finding the most frequent compounds, the chemical components, that exist in most of the Cypress essential oils analyzed. They examined 32 variations from different geographical locations and found that the top 12 chemicals are those as you can see here. The common compounds found across samples included cyperine with a frequency of identifying, meaning how often it was found, 23 times, and concentration, the amount present in the oil, from 19 to over 30% and beta silinine with a frequency of identification of 14 times and concentration up around 18%. These compounds stood out as primary components of the oil with a known biological effect. So I selected them as the focus for my risk assessment. Now we know what's most likely to be inside the oil when you are using it. We need to start the process of risk assessment. Remember the first step? Let's start with the first step. First is hazard assessment. 
are these two compounds, cytherine and beta-selenine, dangerous? Since the oil is always described as having anti-androgen properties, meaning it can block or inhibit male hormones, I decided to make the androgen receptor interaction as my endpoint. In other words, are these chemicals able to interact with this receptor in any way? So what I did to answer this question is that I ran these chemicals through a molecular docking software called SeamDock, an online tool for assessing chemical binding to biological target. In simpler terms, molecular docking simulates how well this molecule could bind to a specific receptor, in this case, the androgen receptor, which play a crucial role in regulating testosterone and cell cycle, the process of cell growth and division. The goal of docking is to measure binding affinity, a measure of strength of the interaction between the compound and the receptor. The binding affinity is calculated in kilocalorie by mole, a unit of energy, and a more negative value indicate a stronger interaction. I want to highlight the first limitation here, which is the binding doesn't mean a compound will automatically trigger a biological effect, but it shows a potential for interaction, which is a useful for preliminary indication for risk. To interpret these results better, I included two controls. Controls means a reference substance for comparison. One of them is isopropyl paraffin, a compound bound in the EU for its potential endocrine disrupting effect, which means it can potentially interfere with your hormonal system. And testosterone, a natural ligand, ligand being a molecular that can bind to the receptor for the androgen receptor. Testosterone, as expected, has the strongest binding affinity at the minus 9.2. Cyprine and beta silinine, the main compounds from Cypress oil, showed affinities of minus 7.3 and minus 7.9, respectively, which are substantially enough to raise a concern, in my opinion. Isopropyl paraffin, in comparison, has a binding affinity of minus 6.8 which means the cypress oil components showed stronger binding than the compound already recognized and bad as a potential endocrine disruptor. Okay, now we know these compounds can interact with your androgen receptor with a relatively strong affinity. But if you apply them on your skin, are they able to penetrate the skin and reach systemic circulation, essentially being in a place where they can interact with your receptor? To answer this question again, I use another computer model called IH Skin Perm. This model is based on this publication, as you can see here, if you want to read more about it, it's quite interesting. Since the oil is a complex mixture of active ingredient, estimating it as an oil would be very difficult for the model. After reading the manual of this model, I was suggested to treat every bioactive compound by itself. Doing the needed calculation, which were a lot for me to be honest with you, and based on the original publication that 0.25 milliliter is needed for the affected area of an armpit, I calculated how many milliliters are needed for each square centimeter of surface area. Then, based on what I've seen online, people were applying or being recommended to apply it on the lower half of the face, the jaw area, armpits, legs, arms, and the genital area. All of this sums up to around 4,114.5 cm square. This number is based on publication on the average surface area measurement of the skin. After that, I calculated the volume applied on the surface area and got this number around 15.94 milliliters of oil with a single application. Finding the density, a mass per unit volume, of that oil was quite difficult but I found a value of 0.94 grams per milliliter. So I calculated in milligrams how much oil is applied so I can use it as an input for my computer model. I got around 14,993 milligram of oil on the body following the dosage recommendation in that study. But we know not all the oil is the same active ingredient. Previously, we knew that around 18% on average is the percentage of beta selenine, which give us an applied dosage of around 2,698.8 mg of that active for each application, and for cyperine, it's around 4,498.1 mg for an average of 30% concentration in the oil. 
So I took those values and input them into the software after adding all the physiochemical properties, which mean the physical and chemical characteristics like molecular weight and solubility and many, many more of those two active compounds. And the result for the penetration and absorption from that model were not comforting to say the least. For cyperine, after two hours and 17 minutes of application, 26.9 of the dose stays in the stratum corneum, the outmost layer of the skin that acts as a barrier, and 73%, that means 3,836 milligram, is in the viable epidermis, the living layer of the skin beneath the stratum corneum. Potentially, it can be available for systemic circulation. For beta silinine, the situation is way much better. After 12 hours, only 3.4 is available in the viable dermis and potentially available for the systemic circulation. Now to make the assessment as accurate as possible, I use the same computer model to estimate the isopropyl paraben uh, absorption and penetration and I got the following result. Around 74% absorption, which translates to around 25.9 mg, is available for systemic circulation after application that is equal to the oil dosage recommendation, which means almost half of body surface area. Now let's discuss the limitation of exposure assessment using this model. The first one is we have a mixture versus single compounds application. When you apply the oil, you're applying a mixture of active ingredients and the absorption of each can get very complex. Using this model, we examined one compound at a time. This cannot represent an actual life exposure, but give us a very decent estimation to be honest with you. Plus, essential oils can play a role as a penetration enhancer, as, which means a substance that help other compounds to pass through the skin more easily. So my assessment could be actually underestimating the situation. Second, my exposure assessment doesn't look at metabolism that can happen to those compounds while passing through the skin because it can get complex very fast. Metabolism refers to how the body process or break down the substances, which can make them more or less active, to be honest with you. This can make my assessment even best case scenario or worst case scenario, depending on if our skin transform those compounds into something more active or less active. So now we have the preliminary info about the safety of this oil and these compounds actually do have the potential to interact with your androgen receptor. They have the ability to penetrate the skin and get absorbed in higher concentration than what we can find in a safely assessed cosmetics. The risk of cancer induction, which means the initiation of cancer, is actually plausible and here is how. But first, I want to uh, credit uh, Dr. Michelle Wong, uh, Lab Muffin, for the idea of initiating cancer based on the mechanism of action of the anti-androgen properties of this oil. So let's talk about androgen in breast cancer. Androgens, such as testosterone and related compounds, are present in both pre- and post-menopausal women. The role of androgen in breast cancer is quite complex, and I don't claim to be a cancer biologist, but I did my best to simplify it, as they can either promote or inhibit cancer growth depending on the cancer subtype and the hormonal environment. For example, androgen receptor in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, the situation is in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, those expressing estrogen receptor Activation of androgen receptor can actually inhibit cancer cell proliferation, which means the growth, by modulating estrogen signaling. In this case, blocking androgen could theoretically interfere with this protective effect, the anti-proliferative effect, potentially allowing the cancer cells to grow. In another subtype of breast cancer, which is called triple negative breast cancer or TNBC, this subtype, the cancer cells actually lack the expression of estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 receptors. Androgen receptor is awfully expressed and can stimulate cell division and proliferation. In this case, blocking AR with an antiandrogen has been shown to inhibit tumor growth, making androgen receptor a therapeutic target for TNBC. So let's talk about risk consideration. 
The relationship between androgen and breast cancer is not straightforward. In postmenopausal women, women who have gone through the menopause, a higher level of circulating androgen, particularly testosterone, have been associated with an increased risk of cancer. Blocking an androgen could, in theory, reduce this risk in an androgen-driven cancer, but the effect varies depending on whether the cancer is estrogen receptor positive or estrogen receptor negative. As a final summary for the androgen, anti-androgen, and the risk of breast cancer, blocking androgen receptors might reduce cancer growth in androgen receptor positive, estrogen receptor negative breast cancers like the TNBC. However, blocking androgen in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer could reduce the anti-proliferative effect of androgen, potentially leading to an increased risk of cancer progression. So now for the final moment that everyone is waiting for answering the dire question of whether this oil is safe to be used on large surface area that includes some high absorption areas like the armpit and the genital areas. My answer would be probably not. Personally, before doing this assessment, my recommendation was not to use this oil based on the mechanism of action. And after this work that took me more than three weeks, I am more confident that I really don't want to recommend it to anyone. In other words, if family or loved one asked me about it, my answer would be an immediate no. This also shows why being critical and listening to relevant experts is very important online. Not every expert can be trusted solely based on their title or popularity. It's crucial to look at the evidence and understand the limitation of certain claims. Another point that I want to highlight based on my work is that the risk that comes from a harmless looking oil can be way greater than a cosmetic product that follows regulation as we saw in the video. So the recommendation around this oil is nothing but a fluff glamorized by this derm influencer who might not fully understand the science behind it. If the oil works, then it's strong enough to be a risk, as we saw. And if it doesn't work, it's just a waste of time and money with an added minor risk that you actually don't need. In both situations, this oil is not a reliable solution and the people that are promoting it should not be trusted. And as a final advice, use this oil only if you want to metaphorically remove the credit of someone's hard work and based on the events of past weeks, it's quite effective because I saw its effect in action. As always, stay safe and see you in the next one. Bye.